Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this evening's guest moderator from the Film Society of Lincoln Center, Eugene Hernandez, and tonight's guest, Malik Benjalou. Officially shake hands. All right, welcome. Malik, thank you for being here. Thanks for bringing me here. Say your name again for those who are listening in on this podcast so they can rehearse it. Say it one more time. Because it's such a long nice name. Nice and slowly, very yes, clearly. Yes, it's, it's a very long name. It takes a long time to say my name. It's Malik Benjalul. Malik Benjalul. So where, where does your name come from? What's your background? It's my, my, I'm Swedish. I was born and bred in Sweden. My father is from Algeria. So it's an Algerian name. Malik means king, apparently, in well, it's, Arabic. It's Swedish night here at the Apple Store. There was Alexander Skarsgård, yes. He was just here a little while ago. That's true. Um, well, thrilled to... Okay, wait. Who's seen, who has seen Searching for Sugar Man already at least once? Has anybody seen it more than once? Yes? Okay, good. Um, well, for those of you who haven't seen it, as Matt mentioned, the film is available. And for those listening in on iTunes, the, Matt, the movie is available on iTunes. Um, what a terrific movie. Um, again, congratulations on the Academy Award Best Documentary. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Have to ask you, I mean, just to get the conversation going, what was that like? I mean, you, uh, you know, there's so much anticipation leading up to that night. You, the film has won so many awards. You have won many awards. Um, give us just, you know, I don't know how many of us will have the um, honor of receiving an Oscar. Probably not many of us in this room. Um, what was it like? I, I, I was freaked out. I was very were you nervous. nervous? You yeah, were? I was very nervous because it, it's it's been it was about that for such a long time. It's like nothing else kind of matters for those, especially for the distributors. They they are really really focused on that little golden man, and 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 it's always uh, hard to disappoint people. That's like the first thing they said at Sundance is we're gonna get you seats at the Oscars. That was like the, the, the <laughs> like from the very start. That was what it was all about. The kind of to try to get, um, but uh, the, and, and that's so not only Sony. Uh, we had Sony Classics, who were fantastic. They're very distributor. good. But I think all distributors, things like that, uh, when they get into a movie, they hope for, for. Well, they're looking for that hook, and I think clearly in the case of this film, it had already generated so much attention leading up to the Oscars, but then the Academy Award just gives it that much more attention. What was it like when they called your name? Were you were you? In awe? Were you shocked? Were you yeah, surprised? Yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. It, it really was. I mean, it is such a strange thing. And you... you yeah, I mean, it's, it is surreal. It really is. And well, you, it's, it's brought so much attention to the movie, and I want to talk to you a bit about the movie. And um, some of these questions I'm sure you've answered. You know, you've been talking about this movie now for... So the movie pl- premiered at Sundance uh, over a year ago now. It was January of last year that the movie first played. Um, and I think I was at your very first screening at Sundance. Really? Uh, at, 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 at Sundance there. And I think that it was, it's one of those films, and for those of you who have seen it, um, you know when you watch it, it has such, there's so much emotion in the movie and there's so much of a, it's a, such a celebration of this man, this music, this incredible story behind all of this. Um, the key question, I think, to sort of, for those who maybe haven't seen it yet, to kind of go back, is what intrigued you enough about Rodriguez and his music um, to convince you that it was something that you wanted to invest? When you make a documentary, you're, you're, you're making a commitment to invest years uh, of your life into finding and shooting and editing and distributing this story. So it's been years you've been working on this. What, was the, what gave you the motivation to actually take the leap because I, th- I thought the story was was remarkably remarkable. I mean, it wasn't <laughs> just remarkable; it was remarkably remarkable. It, it was, cr- it was like five stories in one. If it, if, if, uh, for example, if it would have been only about a man that everyone thought was dead, and then later people found w- that he wasn't dead. I mean, basically, you're a Jimi Hendrix, you're a Jimi Hendrix fan, and you try to search for for just double checking how Jimi Hendrix died. And then you discover that Jimi Hendrix is alive and that you can f- actually change Jimi Hendrix's life. You changes his, the fan changes his, their, his idol's life completely. Only that was way enough for, for a film, maybe. I, I guess many people would have thought. But then you also had this political content. This, this music meant something to a country during a time, the, the apartheid in South Africa. 
um, that the time was such a crazy, you know, basically it was a Nazi country all the way up to the mid 90s in, in the world that existed. And uh, this kind of rebellion, this kind of subversive um, messages that were inside Rodriguez's lyrics and what that meant to the population of the liberal white South Africa was also a very good story, which is kind of enough for, for a movie. And then it was also this lost master masterpiece because when you when you have fans of music that really really think that the artist is the best they say stuff like no no he's as good as Bob Dylan and it's like come on he's a sloppy Austrian disco singer from 1978 you think he's as good as Bob Dylan because you're a fan and you're a little bit crazy and then you, you sort of listen to the songs and you say holy shit <laughs> this is <laughs> one of the biggest lost masterpieces of our time it really really was a, a, an album that I still listen to it. I, I think people who started to, to listen to the songs never stop because it's that good. It's real quality. And, and that also served the film. So it was so much in this, in this film. That, and the detective search, you know, the, you know, resurrection of a man you think is dead, and also this detective search, like a Citizen Kane story, people looking for something. So much. Well, certainly um, making a documentary, uh, and especially this kind of documentary, requires the participation, the cooperation, the collaboration between you and your subject. So in this case, you have Rodriguez, who's this incredible figure who is leading and living, um, certainly isn't leading the life of a, of a rock star when you, when you um, kind of rediscover him in Detroit. Um, tell me about the kinds of conversations you had to have with him to gain his trust and invest him in the film because again in making a documentary you're you're so reliant on the other the subject agreeing to let you into their life right yeah Ruiz did not particularly like to be on camera i mean he really had his kind of privacy around him that was hard to penetrate and and in the beginning i, I thought that this was very frustrating when you're a filmmaker you want to have different takes and you want to repeat stuff and you want to have a long interviews and you can edit into smaller portions and, and Rodriguez, you know, he just said a few words and then that was it. Then the interview was over. And, and I basically, went, I went back to Detroit every year for four years and I didn't get another little 10 minute interview, which is a frustrating thing because, and he never really spoke and told his story. He asked like two words was always the answers. But in the end I realized that this is Good. I mean, this is part of who he is, and the reason why his life, his life turned away, the twists and turns of his life. It's kind of this personality is part of the answer why his life turned out the way it did. You know, he was he used to play with his back to the audience sometimes in the in the like 60s and 70s, and and that personality was still very much present. That kind of very reluctant private man. And so you, how did you? Um were you ever intimidated by that fact? I mean, or were you just persistent and you kind of wore him down because he could have just he could have just shut the door entirely. I guess part of him must have wanted, the, or if not wanted, maybe been open to the story being told. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. I guess I mean he. The thing is, he is a musician. He really, really is a musician. All those years in Detroit, he used to walk with a guitar on his back, and no one knew why, because no one knew he was a singer. No one asked him to ever play that guitar because they didn't even know he could play it, kind of. And, and uh, why would you do such a thing? Because basically, I think he identified himself as a, as a musician more than a... Uh, at one Q&A he once was asked um, something about his, how was it to be a, carp uh, a roofer? And then he said, well, I, I did roofing. I was not a roofer. I think he, he never really, you know, he, uh, he loves that job because it's physical job and it's real stuff, you do stuff. But I think he always r wanted to sing and, and I kind of understood that maybe for him, I mean, film was still hard for him, but I think he kind of knew that a, a film could maybe be a possible way to, 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 to reach people in a way. So let me switch gears and, and have you talk a bit about your background and for those in the audience who are filmmakers or those who are listening to the podcast who might uh, be filmmakers or want to be filmmakers, what, what inspired you to become a filmmaker? And tell us about, you grew up in Sweden? Yeah. Or you were born in Sweden. Did you grow up in Sweden? I did, yes. Tell yeah. us about your childhood growing up and, and when did you decide to pursue this 
line of work? When did you decide to become a filmmaker? I, I, right. I, I don't think I ever decided to be a filmmaker. To be honest, I still haven't decided that. I think well, you are now. You have an Academy Award. Right. So it's, uh, that's right. Like, that's, that's it's <laughs> been decided for you. Right. Put it that right. way. No, because uh, why do you do what you do? You basically just do the stuff that just do at the moment you think is the most interesting and fun thing to do. And I, I used to work with Swedish TV for many years, and, and I found this story, and this was supposed to be a seven-minute piece for, for Swedish television, and, then, and then, it, you know, then it went into a half-an-hour thing, and then an hour thing, and then basically because the story needed a, a quite a few minutes to be told, it went, went into a feature-length film. But if it would have been impossible to tell the story in seven minutes, I would have. Really? That was the idea from the start. And it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, and only because of that it actually were so many pieces that needed, it needs a lot of words, basically, to, to say all this stuff. So tell, tell us a bit about your background, your training. Uh, where, did you, where did you study in school? Where did you study? I studied some kind of journalism, blah, so, blah. So no even inkling of anything in the film world at all? No, but my first job was, in, was with TV, which is... This, in, in the film industry, they kind of look down on TV people. They're like, if you made one little short film that was three minutes long, you know more of movies than someone who worked for 10 years with TV because TV is, is TV, it's just TV. But I don't think it's true. I think it's basically the same thing you do. It's just a camera and sound and, and music, so basically. Yeah. So, yeah, TV was, my, was the school. Um, so why don't we um, take a look at a clip from the film... For those who have seen it, they can watch it again. For those who haven't, they'll get a little bit of a taste. Uh, do you want to set anything up before we take a look at the clip? I, I, I think this is one of the producers who's going to tell about uh, this song, uh, one song in particular. Okay, let's take a look at a clip from Searching for Sugar Man. <laughs> let's talk about construction. Let's talk about how you um, constructed the film. So in this scene... Um, we see your, inter your um, interview with the producer, and then we cut to um, images of Rodriguez, and then we see the, we see the album cover and the other side of the album cover. Um, how did you find or how did you develop your approach for this film and the style for the film? And what were you, what were you thinking about as you were constructing the film as you were putting it together? Were you editing while you were shooting over these many years? Or were you just gathering as much footage and then kind of sat down with an editor years later? I was, no, I was editing uh, a lot. I was editing, I, I think the filming was initially like a month. And then I spent a thousand days editing, <laughs> basically. It was three years really? editing. Yeah. And, and to not be creative, and this is a kind of a good advice if you want to, because I think the time is crucial. The more time you spend on something, the more you will go in deeper and deeper and deeper. And you can, it's it's bottomless how deep you can go into something and, and how much you can, you can always enhance something because there's always something in the, in every film that is the worst scene. And either you just work on that worst scene or you just get rid of that worst scene and then the film is a little bit better. And then, strange enough, there is a new thing that suddenly became the worst scene. Because there's always something that is the worst scene. Even in, in, in you know, Vertigo by Hitchcock, there is a scene that is the worst scene that it probably could take away or something. It would have been a little bit better. Because also, I th the film is just 82 minutes, and, and I think the film should be as short as possible. Because then there is a, there's a bigger chance that there are more scenes that actually are really, really good. And I don't say, uh, I'm, the comparison to Vertigo is no other way that every film has their, uh, their whole universe, and it's their universe you should try to reach as far as you can. And the way I, did, I, I, the thing that didn't make me crazy was that, because if you work for a thousand days with the same thing, you would become crazy. <laughs> that would just happen. But every week, I invited someone, a friend or a friend of a friend, and I saw the film together with that person, and like interview them every week. What, 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 especially about that. What's the worst scene in this film? And and then they told me what was the worst scene, and then I worked on that worst scene. And it was a very methodical thing. Wow. <laughs> That's a, I mean, okay, that's a fascinating insight. I've done, I've moderated a lot of these talks with, uh, with at the Apple Store and talked to a lot of filmmakers, um, and I've never heard anyone put it quite that way, which is find your worst scene and try to improve it. And also, uh, yeah, and also, if you see the movie, because you, you kind of think that you know your film, but the truth is that you're the, the true authority of your movie is someone who'd never seen it before, because it's only about you see it once and what you what you miss you miss and. You have to step back and be kind of understand. You know, you don't know anymore really what it's all about. You need to listen to other people. 
As a creative person, isn't it hard, though? Isn't it hard to... Because as a director, you're supposed to know. You're supposed to have yeah. the answers. You're supposed to, to, to know what your vision is. It's, it's horrible if it's someone who has, who has any power over you. Like if it's a producer or someone with money who tells you, you should do this and that, and I have those ideas. That is horrible. You shouldn't have a... Those people you should get rid of. But if it's a friend that you invited, ideas are never dangerous. You just listen to what you want, and you get rid of the things you don't want. I, 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 you can never ever have a dangerous idea. D ideas are good. And then you hey, are the editors of ideas. And the more ideas you get f during the pr period you're editing, the, the more interesting gonna, the film's going to get. I, I think. I really think so. And so then the follow-up question to that is, how do you know when to then let it go? Because you could keep finding that worst scene for 10 years. That's and completely true, yeah. And the, f the film was never finished. And it's, it's, it really wasn't. It was sent to, to Sundance, basically more or less by the producers, just f to check where we were. And, and the film was so in a state that it was completely p impossible to show. It was just placeholders everywhere. And, and the, then the film was, was admitted. And then we said, we, then we need to find professional people who will replace those placeholders. And we couldn't find them. So we said, we'd, then we have to withdraw the film. We can't go to Sundance. And then, yes. The day before we were going to send that email saying we were going to withdraw and wait for another year, we get an email from Sundance saying that the film was chosen, as, that they had chosen the film for the opening night film. And then we're like, holy shit, we can't withdraw now. I mean, so the film is, isn't, it's, those placeholders are still in the film. So this film is not finished it's yet? It's definitely not finished. <laughs> <laughs> and yet it won an Academy Award, so go figure. Yeah. So d is it hard for you to watch it now? I haven't seen it in a while, but I, I guess I would like to see it again sometimes. So you probably want to... Maybe it's better if you didn't, because you might start. You might go back and start... And start to do the, the editor's, <laughs> the director's cut. That's fascinating to hear that, that it, it, you never quite finish. I mean, that's also the, the, the beauty and challenge of digital tools, right? Because you can so easily go in and tweak and... Yeah, forever. I mean, if you wake up in the middle of the night and think of something, you could probably run to your computer and just... Right, and the... the, the Almost the dangerous thing about this is that the work actually gets more and more fun. So in a way, you, if, you don't, if people don't actually take the stuff from your hands, you're going to continue forever. Because in the beginning, editing is horrible, especially the, you know, the logging, when you're going to watch all those boring, boring interviews for hours and hours. And it's just those little seconds that are good. It's horrible. And then the first like, months of editing is just horrible. It's just everything looks horrible. And then it starts to look nice. And then you just do something small that makes it look even nicer. So the editing process is very, it goes like this. It gets more and more fun all the time. And, uh, you know, I, I, then I was lost when I was finished. I was like, what, do, what am I going to do now? Holy shit, I want to I go back and edit more. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's kind of strange that it gets more and more fun. That is amazing. Let's, I want to switch gears from that for a moment to talk about another side of technology, which is um, the, the shooting of the film. And, and you famously shot part of this movie using an iPhone. It's um, true. Yeah. So folks who are here in the store and or the listening Apple's on right. iTunes, conveniently at, with, uh, hosted by Apple today, uh, you can actually talk specifically about how you used, I think it would be interesting to, for folks to hear, how you used an iPhone to achieve some of the look of the film and to shoot parts of the film. Right. Um, it's not necessarily something people would notice. Because in, initially I, I had used this Super 8 camera, which is uh, a, a real film camera, a very cheap one. I mean, basically they are like $10 today, but the film costs money. And after a while I ran out of money totally, I didn't have any money. Because the main funder, when the film was 90% finished, said that the film wasn't good enough for the big screen. That I had to re-edit it for, until for one hour TV doc. Are they still in business today? Because they should, probably shouldn't That be. guy was, is not working at the place he's working. But, but that was very hard to hear, because when you're a filmmaker, if people t tell you that you, what you're doing is crap, it's pretty hard. I mean, it's okay to say we don't have any money. People understand that. But to say your, your film sucks, that's pretty hard to hear. When so you your money got pulled entirely? Is that what happened? Yeah, he, didn't, he, he had promised his production grant. And since I had promised that money, I had spent my savings which you shouldn't do if you not really, really know you're going to get the money. But I really, really knew that, because I knew he, that he, the film wasn't crap. But it, then he actually said that the film was crap. And I, I suddenly was completely broke. I had nothing. And one of those things was I needed to finish this film was I needed those um, Super 8 stuff. And I, I realized I can't afford this. It's just going to be a couple of hundred dollars. But I, I have nothing. And then one day I, I checked the app store for, for cool stuff. And I found that there was this app called the Super 8 app. 
it was one dollar. <laughs> and I said, I, I can, I will tr I'll try. And I tried, and this weird thing, which is pretty amazing, that uh, it looked the same. I mean, I, I personally couldn't tell the difference. I, I mean, the professionals would be able to tell the difference, but I couldn't. And then it's like, the f this film is not for professionals, this film is for general audience, and they, they're not going to see the difference. And they didn't, and, and it's, it's amazing that you have techni technical stuff that is one dollar that works as good as, as, as the real stuff. So from, what, from, one dollar, from a one dollar app to uh, national yeah. distribution to but sun again, but Sunday. Yeah, that, was, that was supposed to be a placeholder. It was supposed to be replaced by real stuff when the money came in. But this, as I told you, we never got that money. But your producers submitted your film for you. Yeah, got into Sundance. Kind of, and right, right. They must have known what they were doing. They probably, they they knew, probably yeah, said, if we, don't, if, we don't for, if we don't put a gun to his head... Yeah, they're very good. Simon, Simon Chin and John Bassick, two British producers who also made Men on Wire. They're very the talented very producers, talented, yeah. yeah. So they, they knew what they were doing, I think. But it, but it does look very seamless. I mean, you can, it's the scenes in the movie in which... Um, I think you use the app to um, to actually film the computer screen, and you use it to film like outside a window. Yeah, that, that, exactly. Because when I realized that it worked, and I started to really like that look, so I actually started to just do stuff that I that was already in the movie that that I had filmed with a normal camera. I just filmed the, the computer, literally the computer screen, with the the, the film basically, and uh, and th that gave that kind of feeling that it looked like it was film. Though it was just, you know, digital video. It's amazing. Um, I want to switch gears and let the audience ask some questions. Hi. Hi. We just saw the movie, and if I'm not mistaken, you did those drawings. Did the you do artwork? No, that was really, the thing was that we started doing real animations but in color, in 3D, really good, cool stuff. And then we, as I told, we had didn't, I, I didn't, I ran out of money, and I was like, "This is a major bottleneck. I, I need money for those fucking <laughs> animations because they are so expensive." And then, then one day, I, I because it, the thing was that every time I was gonna, before when we had money, we'd actually paid an animator, and every time they were gonna animate, they said, "Could you please send some photographs of exactly the stuff you want us to animate?" And I was like, "Why do you need photographs? You, you're an animator. You could paint it yourself." And then I realized they actually do tracking. I mean, they take the, the, the image, the photograph of, for example, Rodriguez, and they do tracking. I was like, wait, I could do that. I mean, a kid could do that. So I did stuff with tracking. And literally, I, I tell you, a seven-year-old kid could do that. But normally, you, you don't try. It's, it's way more easy than you think. And did you know that this film was going to make this guy a superstar and sell out concerts and all that stuff? And no, that's how, crazy. And what's your take on all that now? That's pretty cool. cool. I mean, right now, I just read in Rolling Stone magazine his development in this city, New York. Like one year ago, he played to 190 people. And then he played to like a couple of, like 700 people, 1,500 people. Then now he sold at Madison Square Garden for 6,000 people. And that sold out so quickly. So they, now they booked the Barclay Stadium in Brooklyn, 18,000 people in one year. That's pretty cool. But, uh, but uh, I think it makes sense because the music is that good. And, and everyone who, who hears two songs, they, they start to like it and even sometimes love it. it it's because the quality is is that high. I think it makes more sense that it, what happened in South Africa, that he's one of the most famous artists ever. I think that makes more sense than that it's completely unknown in this country. Hi. Um, I know there's been some buzz about how um, Rodriguez was big in Australia for a while and how that wasn't in the film. Um, as an aspiring filmmaker, my opinion was that the story laid was in South Africa and that that's where the focus was and it didn't serve the story to have Australia. Um, but I wanted to hear your uh, rationale behind it. That was the reason why I really liked this story, that it didn't have to be done as a normal rock biography. I started doing like Rodriguez's life. The first this happened, then that happened, then this happened. And uh, I thought that the, if it's going to be an interesting thing, it needs to be told in some other way. Like, you know, Citizen Kane tells a story about this famous guy, but it doesn't tell his story, like chronologically, tells the story seen from two journalists or from from a couple of journalists who tried to retell his story. And we had the same thing here. We had two South African fans who was looking for the dead superstar. And I thought, if you tell the story from their perspectives, it's going to be way more interesting. As a f and uh, the, the debate is interesting because as a filmmaker, you're even allowed to tell your story. And now I I, I don't even do that. I tell the story through two 
to other people's eyes, the South African fans, they basically tell, told them what happened. But I think if the, if the documentary as a, as a whole thing should be interesting, I think we, we should try to do that much more to have filmmakers who take their approach on the story and not even have to do that to tell the story through, through someone's eyes, as I did. I think that's where the future should lie, and that's going to make films more interesting. Thanks so much for coming today. It was a really great film. Uh, one of the things that was so interesting that I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about is that this book is a documentary, but Rodriguez himself is like such a character. And he's this guy who's roofing in Detroit, but it's like he's always known that he's a rock star. Like that striking moment when he first went to South Africa, and it was like he knew that he should have been on stage his whole life. And that character that he plays, it was just so striking. Like it was almost like it's, oh, it's no big deal for me. Like I knew this was coming the whole time. Yeah, it's strange that he took that so easily. But I think the reason why was that he never stopped thinking like an artist. He played all those years, and he's actually played in, his, in the restroom in his house because the acoustics was best in, the, in these restrooms. And all those years, he, he kept his voice in shape, he kept his, his lyrical sensibility in shape. And, and he, you know, he, he, for him, it was pretty, you know, he, he is a real artist in a way. And, and for a real artist, it's never hard to, to sing even in front of an audience, and no, it's true, yeah. Yes, uh, uh, w my question is a little personal. You have spent many, many years working on this documentary, and maybe there is a personal dimension in, in, in your investment. Uh, you are a son of an immigrant, and you are dealing with somebody who was also, if I'm not mistaken, a son of an immigrant, and that's my, my first question. Did, did it, do you think it played a role in your investment in this in his project and the second question is since you have the movie has been seen you probably have had a lot of people talking to you about why this guy was not recognized earlier not bef bef you made him recognized and is it big uh, have you heard a question about the fact that, at that he was a Latin, he was a mexican american in the 60s where at that time there, it was a very small minority nobody took care of them I mean, if he has been uh, a son of an uh, African-American or a Jewish immigrant, maybe his status would have been different. Did you, have you heard this kind of discussion about yeah, right. the reason why he was not recognized <laughs> until you, you, you did the documentary? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first question, I guess you're right. I mean, I guess you, is, you always try to identify yourself with stuff. And, and if you manage to identify yourself with stuff, you, it becomes closer to you and it means more to you. And I guess... Part of Rodriguez's personality was something that I kind of fell in love with. And, and he, he was, in many ways, very inspiring. Also, the way he dealt with success and money and fame, that he didn't really go for that in, in a place, in the first place. And it, I, I thought he was very, very inspiring. And I thought that was part of my love for, for, his, his, um, for his story. And the second was about his, his um, if there was some kind of... Um, racial issue in, in America in the 60s, 70s. There definitely was. For example, they asked him to change his name. His name was Rodriguez. It's a Spanish name. And they said, this is not going to work. You, you know, even Bob Dylan changed his name. To, his name is Robert Zimmerman. And that didn't work. And you have to do the same. And he said, I'm not going to do that. And, and then they said, uh, could we maybe do like this then? That we, you, we, we change your name to Rodriguez. So Rod as your first name. And actually, the first single Rodriguez released was was, just, was released under that name, Rodriguez. But then when the album came, he said, look, guys, I'm not going to do this. I'm Rodriguez. You take me or leave. I'm not going to change because you want me to change. And, you know, that's part of the reason also maybe why it didn't happen. He was very, very firm on how he wanted to, to have his career. He didn't want to, you know, sell out in that, in that way. I want to ask a quick follow-up. Um, it comes up a couple of times as you've talked about the making of the movie, and you, you that is um, the hurdles that you um, encountered along the way, whether that be financing or, or maybe creative hurdles, challenges you faced in having to find ways to shoot the film. Um, it's certainly, uh, for those filmmakers in he who are here or listening, it certainly um, is a major investment of yourself when you go into making a movie and you're making this commitment to the people around you and, and yourself as well. Um, how do you? How did you overcome in those in those most challenging moments? How did you overcome that and kind of persevere 
through the more challenging moments? Or were there times where you actually gave up? Or if you didn't, why didn't you? Right. No, it was uh, one time. Often that guy said that the film stinks that I gave up for like two weeks. It wasn't that long. Yeah. You did? Because it, it, was, it was hard by, by then because I had spent so much money. But most of the time, it was the rest of the... F- like, it was a four-year production. And... and the thing is, you only you only work the next day. You only you don't think it's going to work four years. You think you're going to work tomorrow, and and that's how to th- to deal with it and have this kind of simple routine that you. And also, when I you know I, I every week I I when I had those screenings every week with people with friends I. I First, I sold it for myself, and I wrote down all the stuff I, I wanted to change myself. And then I heard uh, IDs, and I said I want to try all those IDs. And and then I basically had lists. <laughs> and when you have a list, it's very very simple. Then it's just every morning you just see, well, okay, today I was going to do these seven things. Let's let's do it. And and it's it's impossible if you say what I'm going to you know if, if you don't have very structured way of working, it's, you can't do it. You have to be and always have a small small um, goals. Today I'm going to do those things. If I do that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be completely happy and satisfied. More questions from the audience. I was just wondering if you have a next project in mind. I have a few ideas of what it could be. What, what, are you admitting you might be a filmmaker then? If you're gonna, are you going to make another film? Right, right. Um, At least for no. the next one. You might not be a filmmaker, but you're making another film. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's kind it, of like you don't want to look at too far down the road. Right, right. But it's, yeah, but it, right. <laughs> Documentary as well? And, uh, maybe. Maybe. Not, right. You don't want to be pinned down yet. You're still deciding. Right. <laughs> what, what, is, what, do you, what, did you, um, what did you like most about the process now that you've been through in this just this one film you've made let's just talk about this particular film and the years you spent on it now when you look back at the process um, what did you like the most about the process and what maybe what did you dislike the most you talked about the challenge of having to log all these interviews you know hours and hours of right. long interviews but what did you what, well well the good thing that I kind of now I'm in, a, in another position and I kind of try to I have to kind of struggle to get to the same position again because it's not evident. The thing is, when, when you do something completely on your own and you don't use other people's money also, you are free. You can't fail. No one is going to be disappointed. And if, if you can't fail, you have so much more freedom. You, are, you have so much more guts and you can try stuff and you can work as long as you like and, you can, and, and no one can ever tell you that you're wrong because it, it can't be wrong. It's your idea. Maybe you're not going to like it, but it's not. It can't be wrong, and you can't say that I I I, I did something wrong. And, and and I like that thing. Now it's like now I possibly could get funding from people. I could get a, 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 like a, a bigger budget for the next film. But I I, I realize that maybe I, it's better to do a you know five hundred thousand dollar film than a, a fifty million dollar film because you I think in a way it's more likely that that film is going to be good. So keep the stakes as low as possible and give yourself the opportunity to kind of maintain that feeling of independence, I guess? I think so, yeah. I think that's, that's really the true joy of this, to feel that it's your little baby. No one, no one can, you know, the feeling of freedom. That's also what Rodriguez is very much about. He never, he never ex- really, he never was paid for his job. And, and he, he should have been paid, which is another thing that was unfair. But... but now he gets paid and he gives the money away because when you never ever start to consume and you never have any needs you are at the only that's the only people who are true free people if you're a billionaire with houses everywhere you you have everyone thinks you're the most successful guy and you are and you maybe you love your houses but you're not as free as Rodriguez it's true and yet it must must be ta- must be tough um, in the last year, almost a year and a half now, you've spent traveling with this film, talking about this film, since it premiered at Sundance, um, and now winning in, you know, so many awards, it must be tempting to, you must have so many opportunities brought to you, and it must be tempting not to uh, pursue them. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's, I'm, I'm trying to, actually, I, 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 the, the email address I gave to people last year doesn't work anymore, because it's... it's it's every single time you get a, an offer, you really have to think about it, and it's like, is this gonna, you know, because you start to doubt if your idea is good enough. Is in a way, it's better to not ha- have any offers because then you you basically have to do the stuff. Wait, so you discontinued the email address you gave all these people? Yeah, because because I mean, when I was in really deep shit, when I the, this film, when I didn't have any money, if someone had would have stepped in then and said, do you want to have a job? I would have said yes, yeah. and I, this film would never have been finished. Right. But no one stepped in and asked me. 
offered me a job, and that was very, very good. Uh, and that's not too strange. I mean, I, I even heard that, I mean, st like Stanley Kubrick said that the only reason why he made his first movie was that no one uh, offered him a job as a still photographer, which was what he really wanted to do. And th that was his job. And suddenly he didn't get any jobs. And then he started, had to do something else, and he started to do what he really wanted to do, maybe, which was to make films. So perhaps by limiting your options, you might... Uh, force yourself to kind of look inward and decide what, what you it is really you, want to do, what yeah. you really care about. Yeah. Because it's very like, unlikely that you're going to get the script from someone who's exactly the thing you, you want to do. These are really good tips, right? I mean, I think, but I think the <laughs> people, um, people dream or yearn for years to try to break into the film business or to work in movies uh, and hope for opportunities that might come from, you know, come to them. Um, but what you're saying is actually focus on what you really want to do. Yeah. And maybe don't try to keep waiting for some other external offer. Yeah, because it's so much more likely that it's going to be interesting if you s and good because you, that's going to be much more fun. And it's the only way to do something that is good is that you really enjoy the process. You sh you could spend four years because it was fun. All right, who's got it? Two more, last chance. Um, one, what is uh, one of the best advice that you ever received? Did he say? Did you? Say, did you say advice? The advice. Best advice you received. For for, for the the stories I received. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Sounds like you might not have listened to it if anybody gave right, it to you. Right. Right. No, because uh, most advice is right now that I, people tell me is that I I should go with a you know I should have a manager and I should have an agent and I should do something with the big studios and because that's the way the system works and no one really tells me that no no you should just do your film exactly the same way you did Sugar Man which is in a way it's very rational I I would think that that's more logical the only thing I know is how to make a film that way but I haven't heard anyone who says yeah, you should sit home in your kitchen for four years editing. <laughs> no, one, no one told me that. Okay, front row. After you've been covering for so many long years, what inspired you? Ab about him, about Ruiz. What inspired me about Ruiz? Well, I, he, he, I really think that there is so much messages in what, the way he lived his life. And when you sit for years listening to those messages over and over again, I guess, I guess he gets into your, your system. I mean, he, he has ideas that I think just comes natural for him. I don't think he really phrased them and said, I, I don't want money, because it, it, he wants money. He wants to give money to his kids, basically. But he, also, but he has some, some very intelligent ways of dealing with things, like fame and with like, like, um, like actually with money, too. But that, that, again, that he, he, he always tries to keep himself as a free man. And, and, and uh, you know, he... he he, you know, don't you don't take ki candies from strangers. I remember his, his kids told me that it was one of his basic ideas that it, that it's no such a thing as a free lunch. If someone is going to give you this and this and this, yeah, but it's not going to be only good. You, they're also going to own a little part of you forever, maybe. And and maybe it's better to not take that. Maybe that thing you're going to get is is if it's only about material stuff, you're going to get. Maybe it's 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 not that important. Maybe to stay free and to stay keep your integrity is is more important for your your self esteem and your feeling that you are someone you you want to be. A good note to stop on. Uh, our guest has been Malek Benjalou, director of Searching for Sugar Man. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very much for for bringing me. And to those who have not. To those who have not yet had a chance to see it, the film is playing here in New York City, still on the big screen, The Village East, and it's available right now on iTunes. So check it out. Thank you. Thank you.